All right. Hello, everyone. I'm so excited. <laughs> Thank you all so much for being here. This is Love Bank Books, presents the incredible JL for her new book, Taste of Magic. For those of you here in person, thank you so much for being here. For those of you joining us online, hello everyone. We very much appreciate your support and that you were, and that you were able to join us virtually. If you would like to ask questions, you can do so by typing out that question in the comment section. And we will get to those as if you were here in person. I will just tell you about a couple of really exciting upcoming author events that we have in September. We have Pulitzer Prize winning author Andrew Sean Greer, New York Times bestselling author Sarah Kinzior, Pulitzer Prize winner Buzz Bissinger, and bestselling author of What If, Randall, Randall Monroe. Those are all coming up in September, and they are on our website, so you can find out about those events and many, many, many more. Uh, and we will be announcing some very exciting events in October, so be sure to pay attention. New York Times bestselling author J.L. makes her middle grade debut in this magical new series about a black girl who learns she's a witch and must save her inner city magic school from closing. This is perfect for fans of Wendy Mass. Wendy Moss, right? Yeah, thank you. You can tell I'm not the kids expert here. <laughs> Kiana Turner has just found out the family secret. She's a witch. This means mandatory lessons every Saturday at Park Row Magic Academy, the magic school hidden in the back of her local beauty shop. Learning spells, discovering charms and potion recipes, and getting a wand made to match her hair's curl pattern. Kiana feels like she's a part of something really special. The hardest part will be keeping her magic secret from non-magic folks, including her BFF Nay. But when the school loses funding, the students must either pay a hefty tuition at the academy across town or have their magic stripped permanently. Determined not to let that happen, Kiana comes up with a plan to win a huge cash prize in a baking competition. After all, she's learned how to make the best desserts from her Mima. But as Kiana struggles to keep up with magic and regular school, prepare for the competition, and keep her magic secret, she wonders if it's possible to save her friendships too. And what will she do when, in the first round of competition, a forbidden dollop of whisks, a forbidden dollop of whisks into her cupcakes? <laughs> JL is the middle grade fantasy, JL's debut middle grade fantasy is full of humor, heart, and mouth-watering desserts. Danielle Clayton, the New York Times bestselling author, says, delightful and charming, a taste of magic bursts with adventure, mischief, and so much heart. Readers will, will turn ravenous for all things magic and their opportunity to enroll in Park Row Magic Academy. Tonight, we are so lucky to have a fill-in moderator that is fantastic and special. Oh, I need to pull up your bio that's on my phone. We have Catherine Bakewell. Catherine is a writer, artist, and an opera enthusiast. She has lived in Spain and in France, where she romped through gardens, ate pastries, and worked on her novels. Her middle grade debut fantasy, We Are the Song, came out in the spring of 2022. And her debut young adult fantasy, Flower Heart, will be published in winter of 2023. Tonight, uh, Catherine will be in conversation with the incredible, the amazing, I am so excited that we finally got to meet in person, JL. Jay is a New York Times bestselling author of young adult and middle grade fantasy fiction and NAACP Image Award nominee. She is best known for her debut duology, Wings of Ebony. Her work has been translated into three languages and con continents. Her former educator and first generation college students credit her nomadic lifestyle and humble inner city beginnings as inspiration for her novels. 
When she's not writing, Elle can be found mentoring aspiring authors, binging reality TV, loving on her three littles, or cooking up something true to her southern roots. And you can find out more about her at authorjl.com. Now, would you all please help me in very warmly welcoming for Love Bank Books, JL and Catherine Bakewell. <laughs> Who's the echoing? Okay. Hope the internet can hear me. Someone can wave frantically if not. <laughs> so um, I have been friends with JL since before we were published. So I'm so excited to meet you. Not just internet friends tonight. Uh, and I'm also reading uh, my questions here off my phone. I'm not scrolling Instagram. So, <laughs> Which so. is totally fine if you want to. <laughs> <laughs> not going to happen. Thanks for being flexible and for joining me up here. I'm like... I'm so honored. I think he's still letting me throw you in. Oh, that's cool. It's, it's, it's like, oh my gosh, my friend is here. She's on stage. It's totally all good. But it's, it's been so fun to watch you soar. And we are getting to watch you, your star rise in the middle grade sphere now. So uh, you've written fantasy before. We have your awesome YA duology and another one coming out very soon. And um, so what made you decide to write this tale for middle grade audiences? Um, you know, I so my I have three kids, and my kids are the middle grade age. They're always asking, you know, Mom, when can I read Wings of Ebony? I'm like, oh, we need to wait a little bit. Because probably you're like seven. I mean, <laughs> I don't even know if you could say I've worked yet. So I wanted to write something that was like in line with the books that they're reading, because I thought that was really special to be able to share my writing with them by actually giving them a book in their age range. Um, I also think there's just something really inspiring and beautiful and sweet about that age group in particular as they're, they're the age where they're starting to sort of realize their parents don't know everything and they're kind of like transitioning from like kid to like preteen. And this is really magical time where I think they're like really figuring out who they are and who they want to be and who they can't be. Yeah. And so I thought it would be really fun to explore that in the context of a magical story where there's magic like right in your own neighborhood that you didn't know about. Um, I just thought that would be really cool to find out when I was 12. So. Aww. Can you talk a little bit about some uh, middle grade books that were formative for you or that have inspired you along the way? Yeah, so I did read a lot of middle grade books when I was younger. I didn't see myself in a lot of them, so I didn't relate to them as much, but I just love books. Yeah. Like, I read every single R.L. Stein book that existed. Like, Goosebumps, all of them. And I the think the funny thing about that is that I'm a complete, like, I spook easy. <laughs> like, I am, like... If the lights went out here, it'd probably scream. Like, I can't do horror. I'm like, like, I, yeah. But I read Goosebumps, and I would just scare myself to death, and then I would sleep with a flashlight like this. Um, and then the next time, I'd do it all over again. So definitely R.L. Stein. I actually, because there wasn't, like, a YA space at the time, when I, when I wanted more books where I saw representation, I actually started reading adult really, okay. really soon. Yeah. Because that's just kind of what there was available. Yeah. Um, I read Babysitter's Club. I read like all of the sort of like cliche ones, but Goosebumps were definitely probably my favorite books. They're the ones that I went to went to sleep with. They were always with me. Oh. Every single place I went, I collected them all. I kept them in number order. And if a number was missing, I, that would just like make me twitch. So, um, but yeah, so it, that's, uh, nowadays I read a lot more middle grade authors because there are, there's a plethora of options that weren't available when I was a kid. Um, Karen Strong is one of my favorite middle grade authors. Bibi Austin, the Amari, um, the Amari, I was going to say series, but there's only two out as of tomorrow. But I think there's a third one to come with that. And then Daniel Clayton's The Marvelous. So there's so many more authors that I read now. And so my little middle grade heart is very excited about, about that. Yes, yeah. I'm really excited to read this middle grade debut for you from you. I love your your books are very, very voicey and fun. And so I'm really excited to see that energy, but for, for littler kids. It's a funny one. If you've read my Wings of Ebony duology, my middle grade tone and voice is a lot uh, lighter. There's still some subtle commentary in there, but yeah. overall, I wanted it to be really fun and, and laugh out loud funny. So my goal was to make you cry laughing in A Taste of Magic. And so far from what I hear, it's working. Yes, yeah, I feel like there's not always a space for the whimsical in the YA space, so you get to explore that more in middle grade. Exactly, and that's really what I needed. I wrote this book in, I wrote the first draft in 2019, and it, I was under a lot of stress at the time trying to write YA, mm -hmm. and so I just wanted something fun that was, if I, I like to say reading A Taste of Magic is like what it feels like eating a warm chocolate chip cookie. I wanted to encapsulate that experience in a book. I love that experience. <laughs> yeah. I'm so excited to say that. Oh so. my gosh. 
gosh. So your books feature girls from very specific backgrounds who don't often get to go on adventures or save the day. So I'd love to hear a little bit about your background and why these types of stories are so important to tell. Yeah, so I grew up in Houston in the Third Ward, and if you have not heard of the Third Ward, you're not from Houston, um, you might have heard of George Floyd. George Floyd grew up in Third Ward, that's where I grew up, uh, he and my mother, same high school, like all of that is, um, those streets that raised him raised me, and I say that with a lot of pride. Um, and so in that area, I didn't see books where my neighborhood was depicted in the story. I certainly didn't see books where my corner store and my hair supply store were magical. I didn't see any of those things in books. In fact, in the magical books that I love to read so much, because I, I mean, Goosebumps is magic, right? Yeah. Um, I mean, Charlotte's Web is magic, but anyway, I digress. <laughs> uh, there's a lot of fantasy hidden in some of those other books that we don't think of as fantasy, but in all of them, it felt like magic existed elsewhere. And that was challenging. I mean, at the time I wasn't paying attention to it, but in hindsight, that was challenging because I wanted to believe, and I think it's really powerful to believe there's magic where you are. Um, there's something really cool about a kid believing that magic is real because it, it, sort of, it sort of parallels them believing that the unimaginable is possible. And I think it's really important, especially for me, young me and um, my sisters and my kids, like kids who were growing up the way I grew up to be able to see and imagine um, things outside of what they might see with their own eyes. Maybe they've never been to an ocean or been to a ship or, you know, or been to Europe. You know, they, so some of those things weren't things that they could relate to. And I wanted them to understand that even if you haven't been to Europe or even if you haven't like, you know, crossed an ocean or even been to a beach, there can still be magic literally on your street, in your cupboard, in, you know, at your school. Um, I think there's something really powerful in that. And so I wanted to capture that in my book. I did similar in my first way, duology, and then also this series. Now this, this is a series, which I know we'll talk about in a little bit. So the settings of the book, of the books will change, but for the first one, I thought it was really important to make it clear that Park Row is magical, and Park Row is inner city, and Park Row is special. What state is Park Row in? Is it New York or is it Texas or? You know, I didn't put it. I didn't pin okay. it down. Is that? Is that? Because no, my books great. were squarely in Houston, and then in this one, I decided to not pin it down specifically because I wanted. I didn't want it to be so specific that a kid couldn't take it and picture it as their own yeah. neighborhood. So I just kind of made it a general area where half of the neighborhood is being gentrified and yeah. the other half hasn't and sort of explored the complexities that, that happens in those circumstances, especially when you have friends who live in the various areas, friends that used to live on one side yeah. of the street and now they live on the other side yeah. of the street. And what is that like? So um, no, I didn't put it down. I think that's genius. It makes it very accessible, which like you just talked about, and the thing that gets me excited too is the thought of how many kids will be inspired creatively now that they get to see themselves in that setting. And like, I, I'm imagining very cute like fan fiction written up in school. <laughs> yes, please. Like, oh, uh, we we need. I know that other wizarding school books have been such a fertile ground for um, for creativity. So I think yours is just carrying on a tradition and. and making it better in so many different ways. Thank you. I'm really excited for that. I'm very hopeful. I'm yes, excited. I'm excited. So this book also fe uh, features lots of nods to Black American culture. And uh, I would love to hear more about overall inspiration for the stories um, and why these nods were important for you to include. You know, again, it kind of ties into the things that I was saying. I think it's really important to create books that are accessible to all types of readers. I. As much as I love some of the books that I read as a kid, because um, I just love books and I love stories and I love the escapism of them, um, there was always sort of this distance in a book when I couldn't relate to a particular set of vocabulary, for example, or I couldn't relate to an experience a character was having. Um, some in, in books, these kids would travel to places and I was thinking like, other than my road trips with my grandparents in the summer, which is pretty much just us kind of driving from either like Louisiana, sometimes to Florida, maybe to Atlanta, like that was kind of it. Um, and so unless it was that, I didn't have any other frame of reference of like summer vacations and these grand spring break trips. And I just, I thought, you know, how cool it must be to be able to read a book and be able to relate to the things the characters are going through firsthand. And so I thought, well, since that doesn't exist, I'm just gonna write that. So I tried to write a book that had experiences nostalgic to me food and music and references, like cultural references that were unique and special to me, because I'm imagining that if that is something I can relate to, then kids will pick up that book and they will see themselves on those pages. And I think it's really powerful when you see 
your lived experience reflected on pages of a book because it affirms your humanity. It affirms like, hey, you're normal. Yeah. Like your experiences are cool enough and they matter enough to go on the pages of a story. And that that's not something kids forget. So sweet. I love I love how mission focused your books are. You're so thoughtful in Thank the you. stories that you write. So have you had um, any friends or relatives like pick up on the Easter eggs in this book yet? If anyone's read an early copy? Um, I have definitely had texts from friends reading, which has been a lot of fun. <laughs> um, I'm really excited. One of my favorite things to do, like once a book comes out, it's really fun because you have your friends who like beta read for you before it comes out. Um, and your friend's feedback is always going to be your friend's feedback. But I love meeting like complete strangers, especially kids who have read the book and just like all they want to do is talk about it because it's so fun to see the things that stuck out to them. Like, you know, and it's always really fun when it's like something that didn't stick out to me. And it's like, man, I didn't think twice about that sentence or that scene. It was just in there. And then this kid is like, oh my gosh, and I love this moment. And it's just their eyes light up. And it's just like, wow, it really shows you that there's power in art. Um, I, I have not had my, the people who knew my grandmother the best because a lot of my, a lot of this book is my grandmother. Um, Kiana lives with her mother and her grandmother and her mother works a lot. So her grandmother, um, is like there helping with cooking and things like that. But her memory, as she's getting older, her memory is not what it used to be. So when she's cooking, Kiana has memorized these recipes, which she's very good at memorizing recipes and cooking just comes very natural to her. Can't tell you why, no spoilers, but she cooks with grandma. So she has memorized the proportions of things. And then so grandma will say, you know, how much of this? And she'll say, um, a dash or, a cup or a spoonful, like because she's remembered the proportions and grandma will just do it. And it's kind of their thing so that her mother can work her three jobs and not have to worry about Kiana being taken care of at home. I grew up in an intergenerational family. That's another thing that's just very sweet to me. It's like all my books have grandmother characters. This is not on purpose, but I'm finding a thing. Like, yes, like they all have grandma characters. Yeah. Sometimes they're good grandmas, sometimes they're bad grandmas, but they all have grandma characters. I think that's funny. I think it says a lot about how close I was to my grandparents because they were my parents for most of my childhood. Um, but I put I put that in there and um, it's just a really sweet uh, reflection of like what my childhood experience was, like learning to cook with my grandmother. But the people who were closest with her have yet to read. And so I'm just waiting to hear <laughs> what they're going to say because she gave me permission to put three of her top secret recipes oh. in the back. Um, and they have like her hand annotations on them. Oh my gosh. Um, and this is just really sweet because I started writing it during her battle with leukemia and she's now since passed on. Um, but I was able to like bury her with a copy of the ark. Oh and so gosh. literally the ark arrived the day before her funeral. Um, and so anyway, there's just so much of her in this book. I'm just so proud that it exists and I'm so excited because I feel like you guys are getting to, to meet her even though she's not here. Also, this is a little off topic. Those recipes in the back of the book, there are samples of all of them in the back. So please, they were prepared by celebrity chef Natasha B who is here as well, all the way from Baltimore. Um, so please try samples, take samples, um, enjoy that because that's just a little piece of my, my grandma from me to you. Thank you for sharing that and thank you for sharing your grandma with us and these recipes that I'm excited to try in the story. This is so sweet. Oh my gosh. Um, so yeah, I'm, is <laughs> I'm trying really hard. We're too afraid. We're too afraid. My mascara is yeah. not very forgiving. So if you want more information on that, I was very transparent in my acknowledgement. So if you want to read the, the full story of how oh this gosh. book, it, I wrote the book in nine days. It just like, Holy poured cow. Out. it just like poured out of me. Wow. Because it, it needed to be told. Isn't that so That's weird? Crazy. I'm one of those people that think, I believe stories live in people. Yeah. Like so living little organisms, they live in people. Yeah. And then writers are people who actually publish them or, or not publish them, but like put, put language to them um, is, is how we get here. But I think everybody has a story. And so I think that was an example of it literally just vomiting. That's amazing. Just vomiting it yeah. out. Now you have to go through revisions. Yeah. Like, yeah. It was That's like, like the hardest part in my opinion. I think so too. Like getting the first bit out and it just gushed out in that day. Did you plot it at all or did it like completely come out the way? It I had like a short synopsis yeah. and then I just did like one sentence um, chapter summaries. Mm -hmm. And I would, I mean, literally, I would just have the wildest ideas. Like that makes no sense. Let's put it in here. Like it was just like yeah. make it as silly and ridiculous as I can. There's oh like gosh. stoves that spit up, stoves with names that talk. Um, because they're tethered, there are uh, spirits that are tethered to furniture in this book. You can tether them to appliances, cars. There's a very, very snotty Mercedes in this book. She's a very bad <laughs> attitude. 
Um, she does not listen. Or actually, she's Alexa. She's Alexa. <laughs> um, but then there's a stove named Lou, and he's actually really great. You just ask him for whatever pizzas you want. He spits them out. Um, his hearing is not super great, though, so sometimes he gets the toppings wrong. But if you yell, generally. Your brain. So it's, just, it. it's just wacky and it's fun so and, like, fun. ridiculous. How is that? Um, I mean, I mean, after um, after we get an agent, it's sometimes there's a lot of pressure on us to write about writing the next thing. It's very scary to write the next thing, and I don't remember where this fits in the timeline of your other books. Yes. Um, so, it was was it difficult to like coming up with that idea initially, or it sounds like you had a lot of freedom internally with this story. You know, that's interesting that you say that because I'm a I'm a very like intentional plotter. And even more so now yeah. with my new fantasy because the world is bigger. Yes. Um, but with Wings of Ebony, I was writing from a place of like instinct and passion. And then I put it up for sale. For those of you who don't know the process of getting a book. So you first you have to get an agent and then your agent will pitch it to different publishing houses. And then you just wait and wait and wait. And you just refresh your inbox every day for months, sometimes years. Um, not an exaggeration. And so during that time, I was just obsessing. And so I just said, I have to do something else. And I think this is this is the thing about, this is the second book I ever wrote. So Wings was the first, this is the second. Um, some people would assume this, the sequel to Wings was the second book I wrote, but it was this one. And I think that subconsciously, you'll have to let me know if you felt the same way. After you write that first book, I think subconsciously we doubt that we can do it again. Mm -hmm. You're like, can I do this again? Because there's something magical about that first slump. Yes, and you're like, can I actually do this again? And so I decided to stop refreshing my inbox and just write an idea that popped in my head without thinking too hard about it. And nine days later, that's what came out. So it got me over that hump, you know? Yeah. Um, so yeah, the sequel of this book is kicking my butt though, let me tell you. Sequels. I'm like, come on, vomit. There's no vomit. I'm trying, I've opened my mouth, nothing comes out. <laughs> Okay, my other fingers crossed there. My other side note question: Are there any wings of ebony Easter eggs in this book? You have to read to find out. Oh my gosh! <laughs> oh my gosh! Okay, so we were talking about we we're talking about food, and you won a baking competition for Barnes and Noble, <laughs> and I love that. Oh my gosh! And I would love to hear more about why baking, what that means to you, mm -hmm. and what you are telling the world about Kiana and Black girlhood through baking. Sure, so why baking? Um, I'm from Texas, so we're in St. Louis, which is still, it feels very kind of South to me. Texas feels like deep South. And like in Texas, we say food is love. Like literally, if you come to my house and I don't feed you, like my grandmother will like roll over in her grave and curse me, I'm sure. So like f feeding people is an expression of love in, in Texas. And so I wanted my book to, or at least I don't, I can't speak for the whole state of Texas. They have some things going on. I can speak for my family and me. Food is love. And so that was a big way that my grandmother expressed love was being in the kitchen. She was in the kitchen. Literally, I woke up to the smell of dinner every morning. Like at eight in the morning, I could smell dinner cooking because she would always say like, you need to get up and get your day started. If your bed's not, I mean, she's from a different generation. So if your bed's not made, your makeup's not on by 8 a.m., what are you doing with your life? I'm like, okay. I will cook early. I'm not putting on makeup before I I'm not putting on makeup at all most days. So I'm <laughs> sorry, Grandma. That's that is fast. Um, but she was cooking all the time. And it's like anybody would come to her door. Um, there was a guy who cut our grass for years named Frank. And he didn't he was homeless. Um, he lived in like this area with just it was, there was just a lot of things happening in that area. And it was right down the street, but he would come and he would cut our grass every week for my grandfather. And we love Frank. I called him Uncle Frank. And um, he always left with food. And even on the, the, the weeks that he didn't cut our grass or didn't need cutting or he was just busy or maybe he was going through a rough time or he wasn't feeling well, he would still always get to pass by and he would always leave with food. Um, because we couldn't give Frank, a, you know, we couldn't, we couldn't give Frank a house, but we could give him love. And one of the ways we give him love was food. So since that's the environment that I grew up in and it's very much a part of who I am and like how I love on people, I wanted to bring love to the page. And so I thought, what better way to do that than food? So when I built my magic system, um, because this series is unique in that there are a few different areas of magic and there's going to be, at least the plan tentatively is for each book to focus on a different magic specialty, which is kind of fun and different from what you normally see in magic school books. And so with this one focusing on potions, I wanted to play with how to integrate the magic system with food. And I thought it just came out 
so deliciously fine. I also was like, well, what is something that everybody loves, makes everybody smile? And I was like, okay, food, food, and um, food. <laughs> so that just seemed like a great idea. And then in terms of like girlhood, I, I love when I think about my childhood and I think about the power of creating things, and how um, this, so we're gonna go like really meta level here, here, okay? Really philosophical. Like when I think about making things with our hands, there's something incredibly inspiring mm -hmm. about taking independent ingredients that are separate and using your hands to create something that didn't exist before. I think there's something very metaphorically powerful in that. And so when I think about magic, that's one of the reasons I love to write fantasy, especially fantasy that uses the hands. When I think about magic and when I think about food, I wanted to encapsulate this idea that these young black girls are making things that can impact people, that can impact the world. And that's exactly what Kiana does with her baking and with her magic. And so you see a lot of, um, when I'm looking at these stories and sort of what they depict to the world and what they say about black girls and what they say about my kids and young me and my teenage sisters, I'm, I'm saying that these black girls and kids who see themselves in Kiana, however they relate to her, um, that they are they are capable of creating something that can change the world. That's the message, and probably all my current books on shelves. Yeah. So maybe all my books. It's, brand. it's brand. kind of my brand. I love it. Changing the world. Yeah, but we need it so badly. It's so it's so good and so healing and. And in this, it's in a very sugary packaging in this one. Literally love. sugary. <laughs> yes, I love that. Taste the sugar. It's I right am so excited. So um, you discuss some social issues and gentrification in this book as well. Um, so what made you want to address this in this magic book? And what tips do you have for writers who want to embed social justice topics into their children, into their stories for children and young people? Um, my first bit of advice is don't force it. Um, you know, don't force it. Like, if you're writing for middle grade, at the end of the day, I wanted this book to be fun. I didn't want it to be too heavy handed on social justice themes um, and commentary. So I tried to keep it all very nuanced. But the reality is, I wanted to tell a story true to Kiana's neighborhood. And when I, I used to teach, so I used to be a teacher, and this is part of the age group, age group that I taught. I taught fifth, fifth, seventh, and eighth graders. And um, that age, even if they're not talking about gentrification and redistricting and all of these things that are all over the news, they're they are aware of them, even like peripherally aware of them. And it might be it might be years before they're able to actually put language to the things that they're thinking about these things, but they are impacting them and affecting them, whether it's coming out of their mouths or not. They are paying attention. And so I wanted to give space on the page of a novel geared towards this age group to let them know and, and show them how they can, they at 12 can impact these things in a major way and really give parents and teachers, because those are sort of the gatekeepers for purchasing middle grade books. Like parents and teachers and librarians are, are getting these books and putting them in, I mean, 12 year olds aren't driving their cars to the bookstore, to my knowledge. Um, yet anyway, <laughs> maybe when cars start driving themselves. To buy our books. It's just, yeah, exactly, exactly, it's educational, let them do it. Um, Kids, if you're watching, do not try to drive a car by yourself, okay, until you're of age. Um, but I think that there's something about putting, um, there's something about um, putting things on the page that kids are already aware of and giving them space to digest and process and really giving teachers and parents the opportunity to have conversations in the midst of this whimsical, wacky, wild, and funny story about real things. Um, because they are noticing and it is impacting them and these were very real things that impacted me. Like gentrification is, it was a huge topic of conversation when I was in college, especially, and then also when I was younger. Um, I grew up in Houston, but I went to college in Austin. And Austin, I will never forget, when I was in college, the east side of Austin, which is across from the University of Texas, was this area that was very similar to where I grew up. And there were people, developers, buying houses in this area and like tearing down the old houses and putting really fancy, really, really fancy new houses. And so then the neighbors, the surrounding houses, their property taxes would rise so high that they couldn't afford them. And then they're like, well, shoot, now I have to move out of my home that we've had forever. And like land ownership to a black American family, to everyone, but especially a black American family is so important. And so you have families losing houses because they can't afford to pay property taxes because some of their neighbors are, some new neighbors are moving in and, and making these like, you know, try, because that area was close to downtown, it was like, oh, this is the perfect place for like a condo, a condo community that's like multi-million dollar condo community. And then you have, um, you know, other people 
that are they can't afford that. And so I wanted these these are real things affecting those kids. When I was in college, the kids living in East Austin were directly affected by these things. And I wanted just to make sure that there's a space for them to process the things that are that are real to them. Again, I think when you put these things on the page, you're affirming like your lived experience and the things that you go through and the things that you hear in your home and the things that your friends are talking about at the cafeteria table, they have value and they matter and you can impact them even at 12. Yeah. What I love about what you said too is it really juxtaposes well with what you talked about with creativity and with baking and magic is that these voices are telling these kids you are powerless and you and your stories and magic tells you you have power, you can create, you have agency. Yeah. So, so exciting. Should, should we have like audience questions? Or uh, we do have a comment from someone watching online uh, saying that they are loving this, and you reminded them to go uh, on a sick day to go take care of their plants. So the <laughs> yes, orange, water your plants. orange mint has been taken care of. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Oh That's my sweet. Gosh. I'm very excited for Readers to Explore. It's supposed Bye. to be a series. I am so excited. How, how is that feeling writing a series? Is it exciting? And I don't know why I've decided this. Uh, putting on my writer brain now, not my author brain. I don't know what I was thinking when I decided <laughs> to write a series. It is the most difficult thing. I've done this in the YA space and the middle grade space. I'm like, what am I doing? It is the first one's easy. It's the second one. You're like, okay, let me just write whatever story I want. No, 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 no. no. You have to write you made a story. It art one time, and you exactly. Got to do it again. And building on what you already. Exactly. And the thing about a middle book, which is like breaking my brain right now, is that you're not writing. So, you know, in the character's journey, there's like, okay, they start at the beginning, they need to learn something, they learn it at the end, hooray. In the middle book of a trilogy, they're not arriving at the final lesson. You're taking them from like the end of one lesson to the beginning of another lesson. It's a really yeah. unique yeah. pickle. And I'm just like, why did I choose this? It's a lot of juggling. You have to do a tiny arc and then half of an arc and then the middle of the arc. And it it's goes like Tetris of the brain is wild. And I'm like, mm -hmm. I chose this. What? <laughs> I don't know. So that means so we get more of your worlds. It's so hard. It it's works, hard. It works out for us. I will <laughs> say, this is true. I will say the sequel of this book, I just finished like the final outline for it. And it is, it is quite fun. So it's, okay silly in a different way and we get to see some of the same characters and some new faces and it's i'm excited for it because series were my favorite thing were you that way when you were a, oh, a yeah. kid like I when would, you like, could go back binge all the warrior cat books yes just go through all of them my yeah. youngest is like obsessed with that that book is always in her hand all the time. Mm -hmm. they yeah. just keep coming now there's ones about bears and there's just like and the wings of <laughs> fire series mm -hmm. my oldest uh reader is like they're literally next to her head and she has a bookshelf next to her head, mm -hmm. and they are all in order, in numerical order. Like, what have I done? <laughs> and she uh, she reads them. At, they, there's always one in her hand. So, yes. That's going to be some more kids someday. With your books. <laughs> have a little, does, does Taste have a little one on the side? I don't know, actually. Uh, it does not. It doesn't? Yeah. But that's, that's cool. Mystery. That will be the that's next cool. time. There'll be a little one and two. That's cute. Yeah, Hoff Hoff Bloomsbury. <laughs> <laughs> All right, and so I guess we have audience questions or any other like people in the in the real world. Ez, I Hi, um, can you talk about the difference between like writing YA and middle grade, like the jump between both of those? And you said that you wrote book one of Wings and then book one of Taste of Magic and then book two of Wings and then book two of Taste. Of can you talk about like that jumping around? It is. I am not a jumper. It's not fun. <laughs> I prefer to sit and read. Um, so I think the hardest part, so I think for a lot of my friends who do this, they say the hardest part is the voice. That is not hard for me. The hard part for me is once I'm in a YA headspace, especially because like, I feel like with my YA, I'm challenging myself as a writer to write harder and harder and harder books to pull off with uh, twists and such. I was just talking to my partner about this on the way here. Like in middle grade sometimes, at least older middle grade, there was like some expectancy from book to book. Like there was a sense of sort of, you know, kind of what's going to happen, not repetitiveness, but like sort of an expected structure. There's like beats that you follow. There's beats that you follow, but it's also like, I'm thinking of like the Red Wall series. And it's like every book is, okay, there's a new character who's facing off against the world. And in the end they win. Like it's this like, you know, the cyclical thing, but in YA, I feel like it's a different animal. It's like, how do I shock my readers? How do I do something they've never seen before in every single book? Um, I don't know. 
Um, I don't have an answer to that, but I think that's the challenge is like in my YA, when I'm in my YA headspace, I am trying to build intricately complex worlds and do plot twists and make things very like um, deep and broad. And in middle grade, because it's a younger audience and a, generally a shorter book, uh, I'm trying to do less, pro less plot thread. So I tend to overplot my books. So trying to plot less and just trying to go not quite as broad and honestly not quite as deep and just make sure that the tone of my middle grade books is like lighthearted. Like honestly, my YA brand is very gritty and most of those books are, are rather dark. My middle grade is like completely opposite. So for me, it's like tossing between the two and recognizing like, okay, I don't need to spend 5,000 words in this middle grade chapter explaining this part of the magic that they don't care about. Like they're ready to move on after like 700 words. So it's me not going in that deep. And and ideally I would get to, I can finish one before I flop. Occasionally, like right now I'm working on, um, I'm working on my, the sequel to A Taste of Magic. And simultaneously I'm working on my new Y series book two. And so I'm having to jump between that and the middle grade. And fortunately they have, uh, I don't know. They're they're different enough where if I just put the right Spotify on, I'm like, okay, I have different headspace. So anyway, that's the challenge for me. It's more about the mechanics. Like, don't be as verbose. Don't go as long. Don't explain things as as deeply. Like, keep it simpler. That's my challenge. Yeah, it's that's nice, a great question. It's nice though. that we have editors, so you know they can be like, okay, t tone this down. Yes, yeah. mm -hmm. yes, yes. I get to be sillier in middle grade too. So it's. When I jump back into why I have to remember that the Stokes can't talk. And it's like, okay, wait, it's serious. What am I serious about? <laughs> Something serious needs to happen. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. Uh, so I have a question, but there's also someone with a question on uh, the virtual audience. Uh, but my question is, which did you utilize more in dialogue and mimicry? Or uh, getting, did you steal like your kids like kind of way of speaking or your friends way of speaking for my middle grade for either hmm. but I'm i would more say the voice just comes to me i don't know where the voices come from that sounds very <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. It's, it's normal for right i know like, you understand what i'm saying right okay um i don't know where the voices come from um but i listen to them um i would say characters I, so I used to teach fifth grade. So I do sort of think about what fifth graders were talking about, the things that mattered to them at that age, the conversations they were having at the cafeteria table, what were like the big things that fifth graders were worried about or thinking about. And it was like their party or a new pair of shoes or something like that, where such and such is not talking to such and such anymore. Did you see such and such with such and such? It's like, those are the biggest things ever. And so I try to pay attention to that. And then I also look at my own kids and how they relate. Like my oldest is very shy and there's not Kiana, but uh, there's a character in the book who's also a, a main character named Ashley. And a lot of Ashley's inspired by my oldest kid um, because she's just really shy. She's this homeschool kid who's really shy um, her mother homeschooled her because unlike Kiana, she grew up in a magical family and she's like, well, I'm not going to send you to a regular old school. You need to be around magic all the time. And so eventually she transitioned into a school with Kiana. That's how they meet or they meet at magic school, excuse me. But their lived experience is totally different because, I mean, you know, Ashley gets babysat by a stove that can spit out pizzas. Um, and so, you know, they just have very different experiences. And so I paralleled some of my like I took little nods from my oldest child, because she's super shy. In fact, if she was watching this, she'd be like, oh my gosh, she's stealing them. But I know she's not watching this. She's doing her homework, I hope. Um, and so I took little nods from like how, like when we go, I mean, she's really shy. Like when we go places and she's like, okay, I hope nobody's looking at me. And so I just like, you know, at my age, I'm not really in my head like that. I'm like, let them look, I don't care. But to her, that's very real and it's very big. And so I wanted to like show that on the page and I feel like that's a big thing to that age group. So yeah, I spy on my kids and my friend's kids, and and yeah. sometimes you find some of that bleeds onto page. That's a fun question. Yeah, to to your daughter, like I'm the same way, seriously. Yeah. And I I my next middle grade is my my love letter to introverts. I just wanted to write a story where an introvert grows without magically becoming an extrovert. So oh, I love that. I can't so, wait for her to read it. Yeah. So, but yeah, there we sometimes you can go up on stage and do things, and then. I'll have to recharge later, but yeah, like, yeah. Was, yeah. But it's, I love that you've included a character like that. That's She's very sweet. sweet. And Ashley, I think I can say, I think I can say this. In book two, 
Ashley is also a POV character. Ooh. Ooh. So we get to get into her head. And that's Sweet. funny. She's, I love her. I love her dearly. Obviously, I modeled her after my oldest child. But she's she's so brilliant and so smart. And just she's learning to get comfortable. And like it's OK. Like you said, it's being an introvert. Mm -hmm. yep. so. And you can accept yourself as an introvert. It's and totally you can thrive fine. that way. Yes, yeah. you can. I can't wait to meet her. Oh, <laughs> Ashley's a lot of fun. She's a lot of fun. And the stove. Can't wait to meet the stove. Lou well. is great. <laughs> Have any other yes. questions? Uh, the, that was my question. <laughs> so, uh, the virtual uh, Margaret is asking: Do they? Do you, either of you have any craft recommendations, books, or websites? Mm. I will repeat that just in case people didn't hear. Um, uh, Margaret asked if we have any recommendation for craft books, websites, podcasts, etc. Oh, absolutely. Um, I would say we probably both do. <laughs> um, so a book that I use um, regularly is Save the Cat Writes a Novel. I use that to be cheap, my novels. The first person that told me about that three years ago was Cat. Um, <laughs> and I use it um, rigidly. Another place I would uh, encourage you to look is um, the website, I think, is Golden May Editing. It's uh, my best friend. So my best friend was my beta reader for my first book. And she was working a regular job at the time. She might be watching. So hopefully she's like blushing right now. Um, and she gave me such great feedback. I was like, oh my gosh, you're like an editor. Like you could be an editor. And she laughed. I was like, no, I'm serious. Six months later, she quit her, quit her job and she became a full-time editor. And like, it's literally how she supports herself. Like at this point, she is phenomenal. And she said, I'll never go work in traditional publishing. No shade to traditional publishing. And she's like, they don't deserve me. But it's because she doesn't want to do anything but edit. And that's, you know, when you work in publishing, you have to edit and do all the other stuff. But she's just so amazing. And so she has a lot of free resources on her site. Um, and I use a lot of them. Um, she has formalized them. I mean, these are things that her and I would just talk about over the years. And now they've, she's turned them into actual worksheets. One is her character table boxes, which are life changing. If you are a writer, they will transform your process. Um, they're just six little boxes. And again, if you're watching this and you follow me on social media, you can always DM me to talk about crafts. My DMs on Instagram are open and I'm very like open and chatting about this. Yeah, stuff. she yeah. is one of the most generous people I know with her time and her skills. So like she will, she absolutely will help you with that. Also, I hope you'll post that website link um, on your Instagram stories sure. or something so I can profit from that okay. as well. Because I would love to It's amazing. Yeah. These, you would love these character boxes. Ah, I know oh, you're yeah. very like a I am, craft, right? I'm a very character. I love, yeah. character, I love character arc stuff. Um, when it comes to craft advice, I would say the best way to grow is to find other writers. I am really lucky to have awesome writers here in St. Louis, but having people who will read your book and give their honest feedback and then you do the same to them. So many times I learn a lot about craft by reading someone else's book and wonder like, what is it working here? Putting that into words and then realizing like, oh, I have this exact same problem. Um, the book uh, Story Genius by Lisa Crone mm -hmm. is really great when it comes to um, character development. And that was, it really clicked for me, the idea of um, a book is the, the character pushing the story forward and their emotional growth. That is what's driving the plot, not just like a series of things happening to the character, which is something I see a lot in um, very young writers. Like it, it reads more like a bullet, a bullet point list of stuff happening to the character. Happening. Yeah, instead of, you know, pushing, being active and kind of pushing over dominoes instead. Yeah, yeah. No, Story Genius, um, another one, say the, say the Cat Rice novel, and then another one is um, The Emotional Craft of Fiction. Yes. Love that one. And um, Golden May Editing, I already said that, everything on her website. Mm -hmm. Can you, repeat, like more. can you repeat the website? GoldenMayEditing.com. Thank you. She's amazing. Um, yeah. I also love the book Big Magic. A lot of people recommended that to me. That's by Elizabeth Gilbert. You would, you would love it. It's all about creativity. And she has that belief that um, stories come to people. Yeah. And then they just like, you can either let it out or it will hop to someone else. Yeah. Oh, that's so uh, yeah. very validating and creative. Um, she just talks about there is no fear in creativity. Mm -hmm. to, like. Just like let I yourself go. So big magic. And she, the audiobook is great. And it's like, yeah, it's just this like soothing lady telling you about creativity. So <laughs> anyway, that's fine. Yeah, yeah, we can talk craft all day. Oh, yeah. <laughs> great question. Yeah. Anything else? Mm -hmm. I'm just a thank you from the audience. And thank you so much. Yeah. Like, thank you for coming to St. Louis. I did not realize I could see so many friends. I know. That's
that's so cool. This yeah. really worked out. Thank you so much for, for joining me. us. Yeah, thank you for letting me join you on the stage. <laughs> my pleasure. I yeah. appreciate it. Yeah, I go buy a copy of JL's book. All of them. Oh, <laughs> thank you. And yeah. eat things in the back. Go so eat well. my grandma's recipes. I so well. Yes, please Yay. do. And bake them. Oh. All right. For the virtual audience watching, thank you so much for joining us. I just shared a link to Left Think Books website where you can order copies of Jay's book that we will have signed and available for you. All right. Have a good night, everyone. Woo